organizations often don't really take a look at top to bottom. So they look at their P&L, and a P&L is, is a rear view mirror. It's the classic rear view mirrors, how we did and how we're doing. And it's an important thing to look at. Look at your P&L by all means. But there are other metrics that could be leading indicators. And, and one of the areas that I think is often overlooked is just how does the customer experience dealing with you? You're listening to the B2B Growth Think Tank, the show that brings you the virtual hot seat where each week my expert guests and I help another business leader by masterminding actionable solutions to a specific challenge they're currently trying to solve in their business. So if you're looking for answers to a specific challenge that you're facing, that if you could solve in the next 90 days would have a huge impact on your growth, send it in to thinktank at thinklikeafish.co.uk and we'll see if we can feature you on the show. My name is Adam King, your host and the captain of the ship at growth consultancy Think Like a Fish. And if you're ready to rethink what's possible for your business and discover the growth strategies, advice and insight to turn this new vision into a reality, let's get started. Hey, Adam here and thanks very much for tuning in. And as you are, I'm going to make the assumption that you are responsible for generating revenue for an established B2B professional service business and you're looking to grow your revenue. So what I've got for you, you're going to absolutely love because I've recently released my new revenue multiplier calculator and bonus training where using this tool and following the training, you'll discover how to uncover the hidden revenue opportunities in your business and be able to systemize your growth using seven revenue multipliers that can double your business in 12 months or less. So if you want to go and grab your copy, go to thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash calculator. Now on to today's episode. Well, welcome to the B2B Growth Think Tank. Joining me today to talk business growth and help out a fellow business leader on the virtual hot seat is someone I'm really excited to be talking about today because he's a bit of a kindred spirit when it comes to helping B2B business owners transform their revenue growth. Now, I say kindred spirit because it's actually, I found, quite rare to come across somebody who takes a truly holistic view of business and helps his clients to understand that a lack of revenue growth is not simply a result of sales and marketing efforts not working, but it's often the result of the whole of the business not lining up to support the growth. Now, he is an expert at identifying the multiple areas in a business that are constraining revenue and the multiple points which can be leveraged to maximize hidden opportunities for growth. He's also the host of the Revenue Throughput podcast and the founder of Value Prop Interactive, where he helps business owner operators gain control of their revenue and profits using his proprietary revenue throughput system, which is a unique process that diagnoses the volume and velocity that a business converts opportunities into revenue and gives his clients a high level view of their business and a clear game plan for explosive revenue growth. Now, that sounds pretty cool to me. So I'm sure you're as excited as I am, and I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, Jose Palomino, to the show. Jose, welcome to the B2B Throw Think Tank. Uh, Glad to be here, Adam. Really looking forward to the conversation. Now, I don't know if um, anyone here listening is um, listening. I haven't decided whether this is going to go on the YouTube channel or anything, but I have to kind of deal with an elephant in the room. Um, Jose, why don't you, if people are listening, why don't you explain what's in front of you just right now? Well, this is the, this is a really laid back conversation (laughs) because we have Adam on a couch uh, with a boom mic in front of him. And there's a good reason for that. He's not just uh, mailing it in. It's very serious <laughs> stuff. But definitely, that's a, this will be a first for me. Yeah. And, and, and as an explanation, no, I am not going for the award as the world's most laid back podcast host. Um, as I, I, I'm not sure if I've released the episode where I'm trying to do the explanation of what's happened, but this is just in case I don't get around to that. I have been on my back for a little bit over a month with what is essentially a broken neck. A little bit more dramatic than it's, or it sounds a little bit more, more dramatic than it actually is. However, that is how the doctors, you know, quote unquote, broke the news to me. But I am in a process where I literally have to uh, have to have to sort of be like this to avoid the amount of pain that it causes. And I am just simply waiting for uh, the treatment to be available. So that in case somebody is watching a video and they're thinking, what on earth is this all about? There you go. That's serious. Anyway, this podcast episode is not about me. It's about Jose and how he can help you as the listener to um, figure out how to um, move the needle towards growing your business. So, 
Jose, why don't you give us a quick sort of 60 seconds of um, how you kind of got started in this in this area and, and, and how you help people today? Yeah, so thank you, Adam. And, and thank you for making yourself available despite, uh, you know, some of these challenges, but we'll make it work. This is good. Uh, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, after what had been about probably close to a 20-year career arc in mostly sales and marketing roles, mostly in high tech, I did uh, something that a lot of people do, which is they say, okay, I'm, go- I'm tired of working for the man. I want to be the man. And so that was about a little over 12 years ago. And I started Value Prop Interactive at that time with a focus of really figuring out how to bring together three disciplines that in a lot of companies are kept very separate, which is strategy, marketing, and sales. And where I found that really lived strongest was in B2B companies in the mid-market, small to mid-market, owner-led companies. Those are companies where the, the, the leadership team is involved in all three of those disciplines, as opposed to, let's say, large corporates, which tend to have entire organizations around those three disciplines, and they only talk a little bit, not as much as they should to each other. Uh, so we've built out a set of uh, tools, processes, methodologies, programs to support B2B companies in that small to mid market, typically a few million to maybe 50 million in revenues, and help them really figure out a way to get a handle on their sales and marketing processes. And a lot of companies at that size, they know what they know, they know their stuff, what they do, but they're not usually that great especially towards the lower end of that, let's say in the 10, $15 million range, uh, they're not that great at the sales and marketing stuff. It just is, they're good at producing what they produce, but trying to get that next level business, trying to drive growth is an area where they're really challenged. And uh, hence the opportunity uh, for my practice as, as value prop to help them with that. And uh, what, do you, what do you find or, or think is one of the reasons why that situation evolves because obviously people start business they have all the thoughts and the dreams and the wants and all the rest of it that go with it they have a skill probably and an expertise but why do you think it takes so long to go from that sort of understanding that this is what it takes to start a business but this set of skills required to actually grow a business are incredible you know that they're vastly different what do you think is the kind of the missing piece there um, I think it's uh, it, it's just, it's not one simple answer, but one that comes to mind in response to that question that I've seen a lot of, it, and it's going to sound a little counterintuitive, which is an overdependence on product or industry knowledge. So, of course, you should know your product, you should know your industry. But what ends up happening is you take somebody who you think is good with customers, really knows the stuff. Let's say you're doing an industrial service, so you really make a part. There's a lot to do with manufacturing. It's not a trivial thing to learn. So you take somebody with a lot of domain expertise and you say, look, you're pretty good with customers, so you're going to be our sales VP. Person doesn't know how to do sales process, doesn't understand what it is to lead a sales process, but is pretty good with the product. They tend to want to hire people that are better uh, in a large organization would be sales engineers supporting the sales process, but they put them in the front lines of being in sales. Marketing they often, and I've literally been told this by people, and, and I don't mean anything derogatory in this. This is literally what had been said to me is, uh, yeah, we're hiring a new marketing girl or a new marketing person. And what they mean is somebody right out of college, maybe, who's going to be maybe a marketing coordinator at best, but they actually put them in a, in a spot that would really be for a true VP of marketing, a true CMO. So the reality is they don't put people with the skills in these various roles who actually can see the next next level and what it would take to get to the next level. So they are often just way underskilled in this area. The flip side of that is the person who's most skilled is often the CEO founder who had the zeal, the passion, the vision to grow the business in the first place. But what happens? You went from zero to 10 million and now you're like the chief cook and bottle washer. You're doing everything, right? You're the hub of that wheel. All things, all roads go to Rome, so to speak. You're Rome now, so they all come back to you. And so you don't have that time. You're really not talking to customers that much anymore. And you don't have that time to find new customers. And frankly, that's not a good scaling model for the CEO to continually or perpetually be the primary rainmaker. You need to scale that out. So a lack of thought around scaling, the fact that you're over-dependent on the CEO, 
the fact that you are over reliant on product and industry knowledge, which are don't misunderstand me, incredibly important that you not be incompetent in that area. But it's not what sets apart somebody who should be heading up your marketing sales. What you want there is marketing acumen, sales acumen in those roles. You can backfill. And, and, I, and I've, sometimes I've been asked this, you know, in a room full of uh, leadership team saying, well, you don't really have a lot of uh, a lot of experience in whatever it is, you know, the chemical processing industry. And I said, well, let me ask you. And there's 10 people in the room. What is your collective experience in this? Just add it up. And it's like 150 years, 200 years experience. I said, so if I brought a month or if even if I brought 10 years experience in your industry to this to this room, would it appreciably change the amount of knowledge we have about your industry? Or would it be basically the same as, it, as it's always been? So they say, oh, I said, well, the reason you want me and the reason you, when you're looking to hire somebody, you want somebody who really understands marketing, who really understands sales, you know, in an industrial category, right? So you don't want somebody who is selling real estate necessarily, but somebody who's been selling in an industrial category. And yes, it's a bonus that they really know the subgenre that you happen to be in, but that's not as critical as that they're really good at selling. Selling is its own skill. And that probably the last thing I'd say is that marketing and sales as disciplines in a lot of industrial companies, in the categories we're talking about, B2B, led by a business owner operator, as a discipline, they're not as they're not as appreciated as being a real thing. Like it's almost like, well, anybody can do like, you know, we just need a website. We need, you know, we'll hire an SEO person or whatever. And and they don't realize that there's as much nuance in that as engineering. And I'm not I'm not saying that like the students that make it at MIT are not brighter and whatever. And I'm sure they are. But the the fact is doing marketing well especially modern marketing the way it exists today, modern sales the way it exists today, is deeply nuanced, can be very complex, involves a lot of skills, including project management, specific domain skills on how to get things done, and also then the human skills of how to, what people respond to. If you're a marketer, you need to understand people, and if you're a salesperson, you better like people, or you're not gonna be very productive. So I over answered your question there, Adam, but no. that's, that's the thought. Uh, Jose, as as uh, as we sort of like covered at the beginning, um, with with my current situation, is a bit of an experiment in terms of you know how this is sort of going to work. But I was just sat there and, and just sort of listening to this, and and if I could, I would literally be nodding my head constantly, <laughs> okay. because what you have sort of painted the picture there of is is I do think it is it is it is the reality of 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 starting, running, and trying to grow a business because that is the journey that people go on. And there's a number of things in there that I heard that I just want to sort of, um, you know, bring to light um, a little bit because I think that the way to sum everything up with what you've just described is the reason why people struggle to go from, um, you know, the original question, which was why people actually sort of struggle to um, see that they need to do things differently from the starting and the sort of like maintaining the business to growing the business. And that is, and it's a word that I think you will uh, appreciate, it's constraint. Mm -hmm. You naturally create constraints within a business through the things that you do not know. And I think that's a big part of it. And I think that the example that you've given there of people hiring a marketer or, or, or someone junior to do a CMO's job, unfortunately, it's, it's very, very common. And I think that comes from not knowing what you don't know um you know i think we in the marketing industry have potentially done a terrible job of marketing ourselves uh, as to you know the real um the the core functionality and the core value of, of doing marketing well and how it sits um you know within a business and how it sort of you know really does bind everything together and um you know i i, I really do think that if we if we were able to sort of you know paint that picture for someone and sort of say to them at the beginning of growing their business it's very easy you know it's kind of like telling your children something and and they only get it once they experience it it's it's a really hard thing to do but i really do think it's about understanding that there is a difference between the things that you need to do to start a business and the things you need to grow it's that whole thing of you know what got you here won't get you there and one thing i did pick up as well is an interesting thing around the story of of, of being in the room 
with um, you know those people when they were asking about your industry. I actually think it can be an advantage not to have industry knowledge because one of the worst things is status quo that can impact sure. the growth and trajectory of a business. And actually, I think the value of an outside perspective that doesn't come with the biases that exist, you know, if you get in a room full of only the people that sort of, you know, think the way you think and all the rest of it, you're not going to get any kind of innovation. Whereas you, get, you, bring you'll somebody get, in, you get more of what yeah. you've been getting. Exactly. You, you just, you're just echoing that. In fact, one of my longest term relationships was a, a company in um, the HVAC, heating and cooling, right? So they, they, sold uh, heating oil, they did uh, HVAC new system sales, and of course maintenance contracts and things like that. Nice size family owned business. And I even asked them the question when they inquired of me, they saw me speak at a conference and they asked to speak to me. I said, sure, and they said, can you help me? And the first thing I said is this, I, I asked, aren't there expert firms that really specialize in your industry? And I said, yes, and we've used them before, but we just see them recycling the same ideas. We want some fresh ideas. So it's exactly that dynamic. You brought that to memory, uh, Adam, in, in, in what you just said. Yeah, so absolutely. So having an outside perspective, uh, I do think, you know, if somebody's never marketed or never worked in an industrial category or in B2B, those are things you might want to certainly get that kind of exposure and, and, and know that that person has some understanding of the basic principles of the task at hand, because it is different. Uh, but they don't necessarily need to know down at the minutia of what you're doing, as long as they're really good at knowing the what, what you don't know, right? To your point, you say constraint tied to ignorance. Well, where's the ignorance? It's not in knowing how to make the machine you make. It's not even in knowing how the industry uses the machine you make. You already know that. What you're probably ignorant and just in the in, and i know that word has kind of pejorative connotation to it but it just means you don't know and that's okay to not know that's the beginning of knowledge is admitting you don't know something so you seek it and and where you need expertise is probably in the areas of okay how do i grow my business that whole growth dimension is a set of skills approaches methodologies that maybe you haven't employed before or you've backed into some of it, but you haven't done it on purpose. And that's actually like our tagline for our firm is business growth on purpose. Uh, because p companies do grow, but sometimes they go like, I don't know how I got here. And so you, if you don't know how you got there exactly and what, what the things were that really worked for you, it's hard for you to take it to the next level because you're just happy to be there. So mm -hmm. next level thinking needs some next level skills. Absolutely. Could not agree more. And one of the things that I think would be, you know, really beneficial to anyone listening, let's say they are in the situation where they're coming to you, they, they're kind of, they're at that, I guess, that that, um, that crossroads where they have got to the point where maybe they're, they're frustrated, they've hit the plateaus, they've tried all this, they've, you know, failed with a few things and they're like, right, Jose, I need help. I need some actionable advice that I can actually take to the bank to start the process of, of evolving into the next level of my company. Help me, Jose, what do I do? What's the first sort of couple of pieces of actionable advice that you give somebody? Yeah, well, it depends on how how big they are, right? So like, in, in, and I mean that as a practical matter, right? So mm -hmm. they're still early days, one, two, three million dollars. You could jump right in and say, okay, let's take a look at how, you know, let's really understand. And, and these would be the same, even if they were very big, the, this very first part, which is just, let's really document what problem you really solve and for whom you solve it, right? Let's really understand that. So let's get to the customer. That's the key thing. The The second thing though, if it's a bigger organization, is is you, you just can't skip the diagnostic step. You have to take a look at the whole business. Uh, you can jump to say, oh, I, I looked at your website and I noticed you're not ranking for certain keywords. And let's work on your SEO. Maybe that's what you should do. That's one of the things you should do. Or I looked at your sales collateral. It seems a little outdated. Let's update that. Or your website doesn't really explain what you do. Any one of those things symptomatically could be the issue. But the reality is you really do need to look at the overall health of the business. And especially as it relates to what we call the customer experience. Hmm. And, and understanding that. Yeah. 
definitely and 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 i think you know i alluded to it in the uh, in the introduction but you know this is an example of why i feel that we are kind of that kindred spirit because your first answer was getting to the problem that you solve and for who it's the thinking like the fish that's always the starting point i think really really getting to understand that but then also as you say really diagnosing the parts of their business and finding those leverage points finding those pieces that are ripe for maximizing for you know i i always sort of think you know the first thing that you do is you look at what's working and then you try and do it better you know the whole you know variability thing people don't understand the power in variability and variability simply means testing you know what's working really well can you do it better can you make it better can you experiment with this that and the other keep a control do something different you know it's you know one you know, doing one thing will get X result, but doing it another way can get, you know, two, three, four, ten, a hundred times better results. Like that's always the first place to start. And then you look on the opposite and you go, right, what's not working? How can we fix it? And, you know, those two converge in the middle. And then that's the opportunity to then look at things like, OK, what do we do differently? What do we add? Well, yeah, I think you have to look at um, having a re- and, and what's interesting about this is is organizations often don't really take a look at top to bottom. So they look at their P&L and the P&L is, is a rear view mirror. It's the classic rear view mirrors, how we did and how we're doing. And it's an important thing to look at, look at your P&L by all means, but there are other metrics that could be leading indicators. And, and one of the areas that I think is often overlooked is just how does the customer experience dealing with you? And that's often an area that, um, that's just poorly understood when you really, and I probe on that issue and they say, well, they love working with us. I say, really, how do we know that? You know, when's the last time we've had that conversation with them? Well, they keep buying from us. Well, yeah, that could be for any number of factors. Maybe you're the only game in town and we're not making as much margin as we should. Or maybe we're on the low end of things pricing wise because they don't see the value in dealing with us uniquely and we have to buy the business, in which case we're giving up margin. And, you know, so you start looking at things like that and you have to ask those tough questions. Hmm. Absolutely. And you've got, um, you know, you really do need to um, understand what that journey looks like and what it needs to look like on behalf of the the client themselves. So, you know, I I really do. Anyone that sort of doesn't understand the customer journey or all the rest of it, you know, there's there's a lot sort of written about it and you can go and find out or, or get in touch with obviously Jose um, to discuss because I think there is so much in there and it's so valuable. But I think what we can do now is move on to the virtual hot seat section of the show. Hey, it's Adam. Now, just a quick one before we dive into today's virtual hot seat, because as the core philosophy behind the show is a rising tide lifts all ships, I'd love to invite you to come and hang out with me, my guests and other business owners and directors of established businesses with a track record of providing good, solid service and a positive reputation in their market inside the B2B Growth Think Tank community, where we all connect, solve problems and help each other grow more profitable businesses. It's free to join, so come along, join us at thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash think tank group. I look forward to welcoming you, but first, let's get to today's virtual hot seat. Okay, so for those that um, are new to the show and um, don't know what the virtual hot seat is all about, essentially this is where um, Jose and I will actually uh, discuss and brainstorm some ideas of a guest, uh, sorry, a, a, a listener's challenge that has been sent into the show. So what I'll do is I'll read it out and um, we will see where this conversation goes. So today's virtual hot seat challenge is, I've been running a graphic design agency for the last 15 years, but I'm finding that the COVID situation seems to have understandably made people look at ways to cut costs and we're increasingly being compared to th- things like 99 designs and overseas outsourcers from a price perspective, which we just can't compete with. Plus, we're losing quite a lot of the smaller recurring revenue that we used to generate as lots of this work is being taken up um, in-house by an assistant with no design background where they are using free online software that makes anyone a quote-unquote designer. So it's getting harder and harder to find clients that see the genuine value and the ROI from working with us. And I'm honestly starting to worry that this is an irreversible trend we're a little powerless to fight against. What advice would you have about my situation? So I would say, first of all, I mean, this is a pretty big one for somebody in this situation. There's almost an existential sort of um, angst around the, uh, you know, the business around this. But I, I, I hope that, you know, between the two of us, we'll be able to, you know, really help this person think about this in a different way. But on that, on, on sort of first view of that, what's, what's your initial reaction? 
Well, I think uh, first thought is re they need to really start asking themselves, how do we create distinct value? Um, and that value is, and maybe there's a question right before that, how do their customers evaluate value? So for example, if they're dealing mostly with, let's say local retailers, they need occasional flyers done or things like that. I'm, I'm making a simplistic picture. The reality is you are not gonna keep that business. That is gone the way of the online orders. Uh, in fact, I just ordered some business cards recently and this is a local printer I like to use, but I needed 150 cards for a particular specialized event. And uh, we went online, it was like a 48 hour thing, boom, they turned around the cars and it was like, you know, 40 bucks. My local print shop can't compete with that. On the other hand, I happen to know at least two design firms that I've, that I've worked with or have intimate knowledge of that have actually continued growing despite that phenomenon. And uh, one of them is because they went after a very specific industry niche. So they actually work deeply in healthcare and so they work with a lot of the pharma companies and so on. And by the way, those pharma companies are still spending millions on design work, all right? Because they're the, what's at stake for them is the value of a billion dollar brand, right? So again, if you're that design shop, you have to say, well, maybe not the billion dollar companies, but we have to find the companies. And it's actually, when you stated the, uh, the challenge, you said, you know, they don't really value what we do. So here's the, here's the real, fork in the road, you will not change their minds. No amount of you telling them, well, we're, don't you really think there's value in what we do? If they don't see the value, they don't see the value, but there's another audience that will, all right, to whom, to whom it really matters a lot. So that's one. So find that audience, you have to, there's just no way around it. Another example, a company that's growing like really big, they started doing wedding invitations. So that's really, very perfunctory kind of design work, print work. Those things, you know, are, are you go into a flower shop, they have a little catalog in the back and you can order wedding invitations. But this company went upscale. He said, what if we did wedding invitations for people that wanted real, something very different? And he created invitations, and I kid you not, uh, Adam, invitations were like $300 per invitation. That's what people spend on the whole wedding, you know, per person, per guest. So they went upscale and they created like unique things with uh, bamboo boxes, with hand-picked orchids and, you know, all kind of crazy things into, but beautiful design work. They were able to hire higher end designers. They kept elevating and they are growing because they really became a specialist and not just wedding invitations, but really high end design. So the question you have to ask is always this, and I, and, and you know, there's a, there's a great book, it's one of the classics in strategy, Discipline and Market Leaders by uh, Michael Tracy and Fred Wassimer. And uh, in it, they say, you have to kind of choose, are you gonna be the product leader? You're gonna be the service leader? You're gonna be the price leader? A lot of small companies make the mistake of trying to be the price leader. And the reality is you cannot be the low cost provider unless you are the low cost buyer. Okay, let me just say that again, because people sometimes don't get that. It's, don't mm -hmm. even try to be the low cost provider unless your ability to source whatever the resources are that make your service, the materials, the paper, the designers, unless you're the low cost acquirer or buyer of those services, how in the world are you gonna compete with somebody like these online services that literally put in million dollar presses, right? They're funded to do million, you're just not gonna compete with them on the volume game. Just don't even try that game. It's the wrong game for you to be playing. So what's happened now is because of the internet and the fact that things are available out there and we're in a global economy and I could find somebody on Fiverr or Upwork who will do a logo design for 10 bucks. Yeah, I can do that. That market, you cannot win, but you can go up market because there are people that will see this as more valuable. So your messaging has to talk about value. It should talk about ROI. I think about designers, how important they are in, uh, in B2B sales, creating things like infographics, content strategies. There's huge opportunities for somebody who has real design acumen, communication acumen, to be part of higher value revenue flows, right? So just think about it. If you're, if you're working with, let's say this design firm, they said, we're gonna go after anybody who just received first round, which you can find on Crunchbase, for example, for free, first round funding, we're gonna compete for that. 
uh, software companies. And we're going to really specialize on creating great infographics for software companies. I'm not saying that's the answer for them. They may not feel that comfortable doing that. But that local print shop, that local design shop, you have to find in your community. You say, well, I'm not going to go after software companies. I don't know anything about that. Fine. Then who in your community do you see doing great graphics today? Like who's doing really good advertising? And we know when we get the local regional magazine for our communities, you see those things that were done really professionally and those things that were done, somebody did it on Microsoft Word and published the ad, right? So you think, oh, I'll go after those people who use Microsoft Word to publish an ad. They must really desire me. No, they've proven they don't care. I, <laughs> I want to go after the people that say, wow, they're spending money on design. They clearly are doing a great job. They, that's who I want to go after. I have to compete with people or go after the people who have shown me through demonstrated behaviors that they value these things. You are not going to win, and it's very hard, and many, many, many entrepreneurs myself included, have tried to enter markets with the, with the premise that we will educate the customer on why they need what we got. And there is millions and millions and millions of pounds, dollars, euros, whatever you want, that has been sunk into that fallacy that I think has been, maybe it, it sort of brings a bit of an explanation around why the marketing industry has a bit of the reputation that it does. And that is that you can educate your prospects to a point where they'll buy from you like education-based marketing i don't buy it not 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 when it's like right there are people that are closer to the, that sort of uh, you know critical moment of truth you know whereby you know they have proven with their actions and all the rest of it that they are actually in need of what you have you know you can spend years educating someone and it takes a lot of work and that's where the industry makes a lot of their money by sort of saying about this but there are people that you can go to and i often say you know and, and this is i don't know you know it wasn't sort of um you know we didn't we didn't engineer this but i think this really does bring back to some of the conversation we had at the beginning and that is this is an example of somebody at that point i think of they've started their business and now they're trying to figure out how to grow and it's kind of like right they've reached a constraint their number one constraint at the moment is their client their ideal client by the sound of it because all of that kind of language that they've used is telling us that their clients don't value. So if you want to if you want to double your business, change your ideal client. Like that's one like huge leverage point that you can do. Now it might be harder because you might not have that trust built with that you know industry or, or anything like that. But Jose has just given some ideas of how you could maybe go about that and, and start looking and all the rest of it. But really, it's about constraints. Like that is your constraint. One of the biggest constraints that I hear in this person's challenge, though. It's a mindset thing. I don't know about you, but I've st I, st I still find that it's still, it's not my area of expertise, but I'm starting to see it with more and more of these questions and challenges that come through. This is a big, big mindset. It's almost like he's, this person has given up and gone and, and sort of like being able to abdicate the failure or not the failure necessarily, but the reason why things aren't working to something external when the reality is he doesn't know what to do differently. Well, it's kind of like um, there's a, I've never used it, and, and, but the idea for if you have a dog and you have a, a, a yard, you put what they call the electric fence, right? Which is not actually an electrified fence. What it is is the dog collar will buzz them unpleasantly when they get to the edge or perimeter of your property. So eh, you get zapped a few times. So what happens is at some point you can actually turn it off and the dog's been trained now to not exceed the line of your property. They just won't, even if they see a squirrel. They won't because the pain is too great and they don't want to do it. We can argue all day about the is that humane? Is that a nice thing to do? But it exists, and it's a, and it's a, and it's, a, it's it's sold all all the time. So I, I use that to say that oftentimes an owner looks at going after a different market, market I've never sold to before, or I don't have that much experience with, can feel like that electric fence, like you feel you can't. Now, generally, I would normally advise people to stay in the areas that they're doing well with double down on the customers that are great for them and so on. But in this case, in this specific challenge you've given us, Adam, is a customer that's dealing with an existential threat. Like the industry has just shifted away from them, right? And I've done this in other industries where they've commoditized so greatly. So you have to ask the fundamental question in commoditizing markets, can, commoditizing markets will always eventually gravitate towards pure price plays. 
And you cannot be a pure price player unless you really have some huge advantages at volume buying, right? So you do that by buying a big machine, big production, so you invest in those things. So you say, well, if I'm gonna invest in a million dollar machine, maybe I can invest a lot less in going after a new market. It costs a lot less to hire somebody to do business development than buying a million dollar press to compete with that, for example. Or you could say, well, I don't know, maybe I'll go offshore and I'll be the, uh, instead of instead of trying to hire in-source or in onshore talent, I'll offshore all that, the actual work. That's a different business model. But you do have to ask the question, who are the customers? And I would say to this person uh, who gave you the challenge, in their community, I am very certain if it's anything north of a million population, you know, metropolis that they're in that they as, there are more than enough uh, potential clients that would value a high quality design product to keep them in business and keep them healthy and not try to compete after that low ball bidder. Somebody says, how much is your logo? I can get that for 10 bucks. Wrong customer. The person you want is going to say this. I think my company is so valuable that I want a brand and a logo that really tells our story effectively. When you hear that, that's high quality. That's somebody who's willing to invest five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on an image package that makes sense for them. So you have to listen for like what are the indicators in that ideal customer? And you you hit it right. It's a different ideal customer. Might be in the same community, could be in the same geography, all that could be the same. But you have to say what are the tells? And and, and one good exercise is simply say, okay, I know you're struggling and you're being constantly being told to compete with these online services, or offshore services, fine. But who in your customer base is not asking for that? Who in your customer base do you really like working with and you think value what you do? You say, well, they're not enough to carry the business. I said, that's fine. They're not enough to carry the business, but they are your template of what you want to copy. So you always think about if you have customers, what 10% of your customers would you clone if you could? Like you just, I love them. I love working with them. They pay on time. They value what we do. They collaborate with us, whatever they are. Maybe it's 5% of your customers. But say, okay, now I know. And start start uh, defining the attributes of that customer. What makes them that way? Well, it seems like a lot of them are in um, are medical practices. I'm making this up just to illustrate yeah. the point. And, uh, but not but it's, the it's the exercise and it's the thought process Absolutely. and that is how you uncover your constraints and that's how you find your way to, you know, the, the you know, the potential. And that's why, we you know, obviously we have to play the game a little bit with, with sort of, uh, you know, coming up with some thoughts and questions around this because ultimately we want this person to ask themselves the, the questions to get to the, you know, to the right answer for them. But one of the things that sort of springs to mind with, with you know, just, just sort of to, to finish up is that, they are seeing themselves competing against these sorts of sites. And if you said like, there's, it's no, there's no way of doing it. So first off, like maybe you need to move away from being a graphic design agency. Maybe you need to become a visual communication specialist, like something different that suddenly moves you into a totally different category because graphic design that has a connotation around what it is. Where, you know, and that's not to be little graphic designers. My wife is a graphic designer, right? So I'm certainly, you know, they're good. <laughs> treading on, you know, treading on, um, you know, uh, you know, thin, thin ground when I, uh, you know, when I talk about this subject, I guess. But ultimately, if you can shift yourself and show yourself the value to a different type of client, because no, if you go with the same offer to a different market or client, it's probably going to be difficult. But if you go with them and actually have a think about, and this is where the constraint comes in, and this is where getting some additional help maybe and, and just reaching out for this kind of thing has been you know i'm hoping is going to help and start that process for them but it's kind of asking yourself the question you know where do i want to play and who do i want to play with mm -hmm. and what is the value to them because ultimately visual communication is a very different proposition to graphic design because what you can talk about maybe it's about going out and finding other people other businesses that already serve a type of business that is investing in the type of thing that you want to, you know, go into. Like there's another way into a new market. And, and this is me going off in a slightly different tangent, but I, I just want to leave that with a food for thought because I, I, I want to sort of get, uh, you know, a couple of things in before we finish. So I, yeah. I just want to say thank you, Jose. That was, that was, uh, you know, thanks for playing that. I, I really enjoy it so much. 
um, you know, you can just you can just hear the experience and the and the wisdom coming through in that answer. And um, you know, obviously, if this person is listening and they want to have a conversation, maybe you know, um, you know, get in touch with with, with Jose because he's, he's he's sort of an expert in this, as you can tell. So before we go, um, why don't you just let people know who is an ideal client for you, and you know, what is the kind, of, what is, what are they experiencing now? Or what could they be experiencing now that, that you can sort of help them to, um, to fix? Yeah. Great, great question. Thank you for that, Adam. Uh, yeah, very simply is, um, our specialization is B2B. So if you're involved in a sales process or, or rather a marketing process that pays off with a sales conversation, right? So that's a classic B2B. There's human to human contact, at the end of the funnel, right? So uh, that's typically where we really excel at, helping people do that. And then if you, as the owner of that company, in general, these are owner-led businesses, but again, just that's just more a matter of size and scale. So several million up to tens of millions of dollars. So you're not a, necessarily a Fortune 500 company, uh, but you find yourself frustrated with getting a handle on sales and marketing. You realize this is outside your depth. And you want to have a framework, a way of approaching it. Because up till now, chances are you've been making investments. You have an SEO firm. You've had an AdWords firm. You've hired a social media agency. You put your people through sales training, and maybe you just hired a VP of sales. And somehow, despite all those investments, you're not seeing the turnaround. I would suggest this because you're asking a crew to come onto a construction site, and you don't have blueprints and you're not gonna get a great result doing that. So you may have all the specialists in there. You have the plasterers and the steel workers and all of that, they all show up and you just say, go to work. And that's what a lot of owners typically do. Go to work, okay, let's make let's make a building happen without a blueprint, without a real, and then a strategy for that blueprint. Like, what are we trying to do? A 10 story building, a industrial building? What is the thing we're trying to do? Without really doing that front end work, you're gonna have a lot of activity and a lot of expense and not a lot of results. You'll get some results because people putting effort against it, they'll put a wall up, so to speak, to kill the metaphor. Uh, but that's really the issue. So what we help people do is design that blueprint, figure out what they need to do, what parts of their business that don't seem obviously sales and marketing oriented are affecting their business. So classically in manufacturing, one of the biggest areas is communicating uh, on-time delivery. I know that sounds so basic and people are thinking, well, what's so hard about that? But if you're doing contract manufacturing, it's a really involved process and it's not atypical for them to routinely have to call their customers and say, you know, that delivery for next week, we're going to have to be delayed two weeks and three weeks and four weeks and so on. And eventually that really kills business more than all the the lack of lead gen kills not having new opportunities is you're getting ticked off customers, which by the way, is not a good way to build a business. Or customer service, where they say, well, we, we love our customers. We, we have great customer service. I said, do you really? Have you called your 800 number? How do people handle that call? Little things are not little things when you're the customer spending money. And these days, and, and, and this is part of the generational shift, Adam, but it's very real. These days, consumers in every category, either from my own personal consumer purchases, when I order from the, uh, the supermarket to get a delivery at home, and they tell me it's gonna arrive by four, and I'm planning dinner around that, and they arrive at seven, I'm really not happy. Well, in industrial categories, the same things are happening. So customer service is a big leaky part of the boat where you lose a lot of opportunities. And you say, well, I'm still getting orders. Yes, until they find an alternative. And then all of a sudden that will that, that spigot will, will be turned off, and you'll say, what happened there? And you call them up and they tell you, oh, it's just you're always late, you're always inconsistent, your customer service wasn't so great. Well, the product was what you ordered, right? Oh yeah, the product was always fine, but we couldn't balance the rest of our activities around that. Huh. So those are the type of things we help people do is figure out what's going wrong with the business from a growth point of view, what is the blueprint for growth, and then helping them really figure out what resources they need. So maybe they do need an SEO firm, they do need sales training. Those are all fine and we can help that owner or that leadership team really have a game plan so they feel like, okay, I'm not just hiring a bunch of people spending a ton of money, I'm actually following a game plan. And if I am that person that wants that blueprint, that that really needs help to create that game plan, 
how do they get in touch with Jose? Oh, great, great question. Very simple. Our, first of all, our, our website has a lot of resources, has certainly ability, uh, contact forms to get a hold of us. It's valueprop.com, V A L U E P R O P.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn very prominently. So if you look up Jose Palomino, P A L O M I N O, and Jose is J O S E. Uh, at Value Prop, and you'll find my uh, my address there. And you can certainly just uh, connect with me. Let me know you want to talk, and we can talk. We can set up a schedule, uh, thirty minute consult. Just figure out what your situation is, and if it's something we can help you with, we'd be happy uh, to have that conversation. And obviously, as uh, as you're listening to a podcast, don't forget that Jose has an amazing podcast as well, the Revenue Throughput Podcast. So. Um, make sure that you check that out as well because it is a fantastic, fantastic show to, um, yeah, just hear more of some of the wisdom that you're getting from Jose because, as you can tell, he's got a lot of it. So, um, Jose, I just want to say a, a, a bigger than normal thank you because this has been a bit of an experiment to uh, see whether I can continue um, producing these uh, these episodes in the situation that I found myself in and I am truly, truly grateful for you agreeing to be that guinea pig and I feel like it's worked. I hope the listeners do. And I hope you've enjoyed the experience as much as you could. And at least you're going to have a story, a story to tell about the laid back host. <laughs> yeah, the laid back host. No, Adam, it's been great. And you asked some really sharp questions. It's very helpful. And you got me talking on a topic I'm very excited about. You're excited about it. So two, two, uh, two, two guys talking business. It's always good. Yeah, all that's all that's missing, I guess, is a is a beer in hand. But there, there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Jose! A, a big thank you ever so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and we will talk soon. All right, my pleasure. So that's it for this episode. I hope you found it valuable. I hope you got some great ideas that you can take away and apply to your business to help you grow. If you did, please share it with somebody else that might also find this valuable because they will thank you for it. Also to let you know that I have a podcast gift page where I put a lot of resources that I love to share with my listeners. You can find the links to join the Facebook community there and you can get my book, the Conversational Relationship Marketing and the audiobook version all for free, plus a number of other resources I'll be adding over time on that page. So make sure you head there to thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash podcast gift and you can help yourself to the things that make most sense to you and if you have enjoyed the show please make sure you're subscribed you'll get updated as the new episodes come out and finally last favor please consider giving the show your honest rating and review on apple podcasts i read every single one they mean the world for me i love hearing from my listeners and it does help others find the show as well so if you want to go and do that i'd really appreciate it until next time have an awesome day and we'll speak soon